The Lord be with you. Oh, man. Friends, grace and peace to you in the, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship here at Oxford Presbyterian Church. We are so delighted uh, that you have chosen to spend your Sunday morning with us. Uh, this is a very special uh, Sunday morning here at OPC, of course. Uh, this is the first of four Sundays uh, where we are celebrating a union worship services with our friends at Oxford United Methodist Church. Uh, so to all of our friends from the Methodist Church across the street, welcome. We are so glad that you are here. It's so great to see Hello! Yes, it's great to see some wonderful, familiar faces. Uh, and of course, we want to extend a very special thanks to Pastor Caleb Henry, who's just way back there, back behind the pulpit. Some of you may be able to see him, and some of you might not, but he's here. We are thrilled that he is here uh, to be with us, to be leading worship with us this morning, uh, and of course, uh, uh, to bring the Word of God. This is a, a, a really a, a busy summer for so many of us, and we have a lot of things going on. But first, actually, before we get to that, some of you have probably been glancing through your pew and found this handsome blue friendship pad and thought, oh my goodness, what is this? Oh, there's a place to put my name in. I'm so glad that you noticed that. Uh, we would just encourage you to find the friendship pad and, and to sign your name so that we might be made aware of your presence with us in worship this morning. And while you're at it, go ahead and pass it to your neighbor and uh, uh, invite and encourage them to do the same. Uh, speaking of your bulletin, we do have a number of uh, uh, announcements coming up. Uh, for those of you who are keeping an eye on the newsletter, there is a special sabbatical issue uh, of the Connections newsletter. Uh, this week, of course, we embarked on uh, another life-giving practice uh, of pastoral sabbatical. Uh, Pastor Lawrence uh, is on sabbatical, uh, uh, actually just started last Monday, in fact. Uh, so we are thrilled that he has the opportunity to, to spend the next three months uh, in spiritual growth and spiritual enrichment. Uh, and from, uh, let's see, uh, so our ministry offers a special edition of the newsletter to help you also dwell deeply in this time of, of renewal. Uh, so if you would like to learn more about what Pastor Lawrence is doing during his sabbatical time and how you can also uh, practice Sabbath as a spiritual practice intentionally in your own life during this next three months, uh, keep an eye out for that special sabbatical edition of the Connections newsletter. Uh, let's see. Uh, so, uh, speaking of our union worship services over the next four Sundays, I want to just give you all the schedule because a few people have asked, like, okay, so our, who's, when are we over here and when are we over there? Uh, so, this Sunday and next Sunday, of course, we are delighted to welcome our friends from Oxford United Methodist Church here at OPC. Pastor Caleb will be preaching, of course, this morning and again next Sunday. Uh, and then on uh, the following two Sundays, that's June 23rd and the 30th, uh, Oxford Presbyterian Church will be worshiping across the street at the Methodist Church. Uh, and our friends over there will get to endure two Sundays of hearing me preach. Uh, so that'll be a lot of fun. Also, over the summer months, we do have some Sunday school news. Uh, Sundays, summer Sunday school begins today. Uh, this program is aimed at children three and, uh, excuse me, children five and up. Uh, beginning on uh, Sunday, July the 7th from the first to the first week of August, the Caring for Creation team will be running a five-week program using art to talk about God's creation. Uh, so after, uh, a little bit later on in the worship service, when we come to the time with young disciples, we'll invite our children both, from both the Presbyterian Church and the Methodist Church to come forward. And then uh, following that time with young disciples, any children are welcome to go to church school. And this morning, it's going to be a little bit different. This morning, it is going to be in the CCNS area. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of times we do it upstairs. This, this week and next week, it's going to be uh, in the CCNS area. So it's going to be just through this door and then through the Molyneux Lounge and then through those double doors into the nursery. Now, if you heard me say that, you're like, I don't know what any of that means. Don't worry. There will also be a, a parent and adult that will help shepherd uh, our young people into the right place. Uh, so we're very, very grateful for that. Speaking of our young people, uh, our Intergenerational Vacation Bible School is Monday, June 17th through Friday, June 21st uh, at the Seminary Church from 5 o'clock till 8.30 p.m. Dinner is provided. Uh, bring your entire family. This is an intergenerational VBS experience, and it is open to the community. It is open to our friends here at the Presbyterian Church and the Methodist Church and Catholic Church and the Episcopal Church, anybody who would like to participate. Um, if you would like to uh, either sign up to participate participate or to volunteer to help, there's a QR code in your bulletin this morning. Uh, you can scan that with your phone or you can just visit our website. Uh, we would love your help this year. 
And finally, we have a travel study opportunity in Lithuania. Ellen Smith, uh, our PCUSA mission co-worker in Eastern Europe, will be leading a travel study seminar October 14th through 24th, uh, in, uh, yeah, October 24th, October 14th through 24th in Lithuania. This study seminar will explore the painful and lingering legacies of war in the small country of Lithuania located on the Baltic Sea, bordering uh, Latvia, Russia, Poland, and Belarus. Uh, if you are interested in registering for this, the registrations are requested by June 14th. That is coming up. So if you've had this on your radar and thinking, I might like to participate, we are approaching the time to go ahead and sign up. Uh, so for more information, uh, you can scan, there's also a QR, there's a QR code for that as well in your bulletin, uh, or you can visit our church website. Friends, at this time, let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship and glorify the Lord our God. Friends, as I said just a moment ago, I'm, I'm so excited and thrilled as we enter into these weeks of summer where our two congregations get to worship together in this way. Uh, this is one of my uh, favorite times of the year when we have these union worship services together. Uh, I remember, I think it was a year or two ago, Pastor Caleb, you once said, the only thing that really separates our congregations uh, is a bit of concrete on Church Street. Uh, these worship services remind us that we are all part of the body of Christ, that we are all part of God's beloved family together. Uh, that we all worship the same God, and that we are also extended the same grace of that Lord and God together. So friends, as we come together to worship in this space, we just want to extend a very hearty welcome to each and every one of you. Uh, all are welcome in this space. You are welcome. Friends, we here at OPC, we welcome your age, your race, your point of origin, whether you feel devout with faith, or whether you walk into places like this with some doubts or questions or even skepticism. Friends, we welcome your gender identity, your sexual orientation, your political leanings, whatever they may be. No matter how you were abled, physically, mentally, or emotionally, beloved, you are part of the body of Christ. And we seek to extend that welcome to one another because it is Christ who welcomed us first. So friends, at this time, I invite those of you who are worshiping with us here in the sanctuary to join me in standing as you are able, either in body or in spirit, <coughs> as we come together for our call to worship this morning that you'll find printed in your bulletin. Please join me. With God there is forgiveness, steadfast love, and the power to redeem. We wait for the Lord, who is our hope. Long night, we watch for God more passionately than the sun's first light. Thanks be to God, alleluia, amen. <clears throat> Our first hymn this morning is hymn number 401 in your purple glory to God hymnal. Here in this place, let us join our hearts together in song.
beloved, in trust and reassurance of God's love and God's mercy and God's forgiveness of us, let us call on the divine's holy name as we offer our prayers of confession together in unison. Please join me. Merciful God, we try to hide from your presence, knowing that we have traded your abundant life for a wasteland of sin. We have not followed your will, but instead heed other voices and pursue our own desires at the expense of others. Restore us, O God, in steadfast love. Look upon us and reclothe us in your grace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, in the gift of this silent moment, we listen for the voice of God who claims us and loves us as beloved children. So at this time, let us now take a moment to offer our personal prayers of confession together in silence. Amen. Siblings in Christ, do not lose heart. We are being renewed day by day through the grace of Christ extended to us. Believe the good news, beloved. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. Friends, as the body of Christ here in the sanctuary and at home, may the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Amen. We invite those here in the sanctuary to turn and share the peace of Christ to your neighbor. And if your neighbor is someone that you have not yet met, uh, please introduce yourself for all are welcome in this place. <clears throat> Let's try that one more time. One, two, three. Peace be with you. And also with you. Okay, that sounded pretty good. Welcome, welcome. Good morning. It is time for our time with young disciples. Yes, everybody, come on down. Come on down. I'm sure you're all wondering why I called you here this morning. Uh, no, this is, uh, it's, this is our time with young disciples. If we have any children or young disciples who would, love to, who would like to come forward, we would love to see your face. Good morning. It's so good to see you all. We've got some new faces here this morning. It's great to see all of you. And I wonder if we could turn around. If you guys look way up in the balcony there, there's a camera right in the middle of the balcony. Do you see it? Do you see that camera? Can we wave just very quickly to any friends who might be watching at home and say, Good morning! Good morning! And that's our friend Michael. He helps us out with the live stream every morning. Can we wave to him and say, good morning, Michael? Good morning, Michael. Ah, oh, man, very good. Hey, uh, it's so good to see you guys. Uh, so this Sunday is a little bit different uh, for all of us. Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you're from Oxford United Methodist Church. Okay, so we've got, we've got some friends visiting. Raise your hand if you go to church here at Oxford Presbyterian Church. Okay, so we've got, we've got some friends visiting. Uh, so we're all kind of, we, some of you may know each other. Some of you may not know each other. Some of you may not know me. You probably know Pastor Caleb if you go to the Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Mark. I'm one of the pastors here at Oxford Presbyterian Church. And so I'm going to teach you, if you're new here, uh, I'm going to teach you something that we do here at the Presbyterian Church every Sunday when we have uh, a time with young disciples. Uh, at the very end, we stand up and we get in a circle, and then we cross our arms like this, and we link hands with our neighbor, uh, and then we say some stuff together in unison. We're going to try it a little bit later. But this morning, our circle is a little bit bigger 
than it normally is because we've got some new faces here. And I was thinking about that, you know, in just a few minutes, Pastor Caleb is going to be preaching from a, a passage from Mark's gospel where Jesus is asked, uh, who are his brothers, sisters, siblings, his friends, who is in God's circle of care? And one of the things that Jesus says is that that circle, God, that circle of who God loves is so big that we can't even, we can't even like think about it. That's how big God's circle of love is. And so we make a circle every Sunday, and we're going to try, what I'd like us to do in just a minute, we're going to stand up, and we're going to see if we can make the circle as big as we can. Can we do that? Yeah. Let's try. Okay, stand up. Stand up. Okay. Let's make a circle. Okay, it's pretty big. It's pretty big, but I want, but you know what? I want, before we link hands, I wonder if we can make it even bigger. Can we get I wonder if we can even get, maybe get a few other people to come into the circle. Oh, and we got some grown-ups right over here. They didn't know that I was going to put them on the spot. <laughs> okay, that's pretty good. Oh, yeah. Oh, let's see if we can make the circle even bigger. That's pretty big. That's pretty big. I wonder, I wonder if, we, if we have maybe even like three or four other grown-ups that are feeling brave this morning that would like to, be, to make the circle even bigger. Anybody? <laughs> Please no, Pastor Mark. We really didn't want to do that this morning. <laughs> Oh, look at this. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So now we're making the circle even bigger. And you know, when, 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 this, when the circle gets bigger and bigger, we are reminded that God's love for us is so big, it's bigger than this. Or like, it's so big we can't even imagine it. So here's what we're going to do. Go ahead and take your arms, just like this. Cross one hand over the other hand, just like that. Lock hands with your neighbor. Good, good, good. Good, good, good. Okay. So for those of you who go to church here at the Presbyterian Church, you probably know what we're about to do. But for those of you who are visying, you may be like, what in the world are we doing right now? So what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to say a few things together in unison. And then we are going to try, when I give you the signal, we're going to try to untwist your arms without letting go of your neighbor's hand. Okay? We're going to try it in just a minute. Uh, but one of the things that we say every Sunday, if you, if you know the words, say them nice and loud, because some of the folks here might not know the words. Every Sunday, we say that no matter who you are, and no matter what you do, and no matter where you go, you are always loved by God. We are always loved by God every day, all of us. And so what we say is that we don't want to keep that love cooped up here in the circle. We want to send it out into the world. And this is where we try to untwist. Let's see if we can do it. Don't let go. Don't let go. Very good. Oh, look at that. Yes, yeah, yeah, give them a round of applause. You guys did great. Okay, so now here's the next part. Here's the next part. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn, and I'm going to need all of my Presbyterian grown-ups to help us out, because I know that you know the words to this next bit. Uh, I'm going to ask the grown-ups if they have a blessing for us, and then we are going to give a blessing to them. So they are going to say, may God be with you there, which means when you guys go to church school, and then we are going to say all together, may God be with you here. Okay, so grown-ups first, kids second. Got it? All right, let's try it. To all the grown-ups sitting in the pews, do you have a blessing for our young disciples this morning? May God be with you there. Oh, thank you. And now... We're say, may God be with you here on the, on the count of three. You ready? One, two, three. May God be with you here. Oh, man. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you all so much for visiting us this morning. And now you're all going vi- to follow these lovely grown-ups as we go off to church school. And friends, may God's love and God's blessing be with us this day and every day. And, and a very special thanks to the grown-ups that helped make our circle larger this morning. Thank you for being especially brave. Getting my steps in this morning. <laughs> friends, would you please join me for our prayer for, for illumination this morning? In unison, please. We are waiting, O oh God to hear your word, for in your word is our hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May we hear your voice in the name of Christ. We ask this and all things. Amen. Amen. Friends, as we make our way through these four Sundays of union worship together, uh, Pastor Caleb and I had a chance to meet at Cofania a couple of weeks ago to look at these passages from Mark uh, that the lectionary follows over the next four Sundays. And one of the things that we were really trying to look for is, is there sort of a common spiritual theme 
uh, that runs throughout the next uh, several Sundays. And one of the words that we kept coming back to over and over again uh, was the word interruptions. And there are a lot of different kinds of interruptions that, uh, that appear in Scripture over these passages of Mark, as you'll hear over the next several Sundays. Um, and interruptions in the gospel can reveal all sorts of things. They can be, uh, sometimes an interruption can feel inconvenient or disruptive, but sometimes they can also reveal the redemptive work that God is doing in the lives of God's followers, of God's people, and maybe in our lives as well. So I hope as we turn now to the third chapter of Mark's record of the gospel, beginning at the 20th verse, uh, that you will listen for God's word for us and listen for the ways that God is interrupting our lives uh, in revealing and redemptive ways. And the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebul, and the ruler of the demons, has, he casts out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then, indeed, the house can be plundered. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. For the word of God in Scripture for the Word of God among us, for the Word of God within us. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Well, it is indeed so good to be with you all once again this morning. Uh, these services really do truly unite us together, and I am so honored not just to be with you this morning, but that I get to sit in Pastor Lawrence's throne <laughs> right here. Now, I have many talents, but I cannot make bread, so I don't know <laughs> what you expect of me this morning, but we are going to have these four weeks together, and we are going to be focusing on interruptions, and if you think about it, being here today is kind of an interruption to many of our schedules. In particular, maybe where we sit this morning. Some of you Presbyterians came in here this morning, it's like, oh, the Methodists are with us. They're sitting in my pew. <laughs> our routines are interrupted a little bit. Maybe you had to park somewhere different this morning so that it was an easier walk for you. There's all kinds of interruptions that come here, but we believe that there is holy power in some interruptions. And these four weeks, we'll be focusing on those interruptions in the Gospel of Mark as Jesus is journeying. And it seems like Jesus' journey throughout the Gospel of Mark consists of one interruption after another. Almost by design, these interruptions are attracted to Jesus. And so we're going to be focusing in on those to learn a little bit about how we can handle the interruptions in our own lives. But let me inquire of you this morning. Have you ever had a day, a moment in your life where you had a plan for how that day would go, but it constantly gets interrupted? It's just a series of interruptions. You sit down to read a book, and the phone rings. You drive to your doctor's appointment, but there's construction work being done on Route 27. You get your seat at the baseball game, and then a storm rolls in. You go to exercise, and your child interrupts you, asking for you to fix their toy. 
Say we often call these kinds of interruptions annoyances, or at least we place them in that category. They interfere with what we want to do or what we feel needs to be done. But here's the interesting thing about the interruptions that occur in the Gospel of Mark to Jesus. They never throw Jesus off. They don't derail the mission that God has in the world, and they do not delay the arrival of God's kingdom. Because behind every interruption is an invitation. An invitation to behold the explosive power of the gospel and the reality of new life that Christ is bringing into the world. Now, I'm not saying that every interruption we experience in life is like this, but I do think that if we are patient enough to attend to the interruptions that occur to Jesus, maybe we too will experience the explosive power of gospel in our own midst when interruptions occur. Now, I'm not saying every interruption is this way, because sometimes a traffic jam is just a traffic jam. It's not a sign from God. (laughs) And I can think many years ago, uh, when I was still in college, I went on vacation with my family to Florida, and we were going to see a movie that day. It was particularly hot. We didn't want to go to the beach, so we decided, let's, let's go see a movie. It's air-conditioned. It'll be relaxing to be in the dark and, and enjoy that. And as we got out of our car in the parking lot, a homeless man came up to me and asked if he could have some money for some food. And I said, well, I'm not really comfortable giving you money in this moment, but I'll walk with you. Uh, to to buy something for you. And he says, well, there's this hot dog stand not too far from here. And so we walk with him. My family is kind of annoyed with me at this moment because they were like, we got a movie to get to, but I'm walking with him to the hot dog stand. And I get him the hot dog. And and I'll say, I was not annoyed when he went beyond asking if I would take him to go get something done in another place of town. And I said, I don't have time for this. But I was quite annoyed that when he got his hot dog, he happened to put ketchup on that hot dog. (laughs) Because in certain parts of this country, that is an abomination. (laughs) And it's just thankful that that happened in Florida, not Chicago. (laughs) But interruptions like these occur in life. And what do we do with those interruptions is the question that I want us to ponder this morning. I wonder if we have the the courage to lean in a little more when interruptions do occur. And perhaps you will discover that there is something in that interruption to change your life. Now, when I begin this morning, I want to make sure that uh, where we are um, and, and how we are prepared for this understanding of Jesus and what is going on in their story today. Because the power of the human mind is that if we are prepared to look for certain things, we will notice them a lot more readily throughout whatever it is that we're looking at. And so this morning, I want to provide a couple things to help us understand where we're going with this Jesus and what is coming to him. See, Jesus has already been up to some things in the Gospel of Mark. He's been healing people. He's been casting out demons. And in the midst of all these wondrous things, Jesus is slowly uh, assembling a group of people around him, a team, if you will. In fact, right before our story for today, Jesus goes up on a mountain, and it says that he called those whom he wanted. That is, the 12 disciples. Basically, Jesus is assembling the Avengers here. He's bringing these people together to travel with him. He calls out, and magically the twelve arrive, and they are now ready to travel with Jesus. We might wonder what makes them actually want to follow this Jesus. They have to be wondering this all the time. And all throughout, you have to wonder if the disciples were wondering, like, what what is Jesus up to? Like, why is he doing this? And, And why am I following this person in the first place? Because this Jesus is actually kind of odd. And he does some strange things. And this is the second thing I want us to attend to this morning before we get into our story. One of the reasons I like the Gospel of Mark, and it is my favorite gospel, is that Jesus throughout the book is really strange. He does some strange things. And we often, we come to 
stories like this with a Jesus already in mind. And we just kind of place that Jesus into the story. And we don't attend to how strange Jesus actually is in the text. See, we like a tame Jesus. A Jesus that abides by our expectations. See, our Jesus is airbrushed and whitewashed so that when we look at Jesus, we see somebody that looks like us, who talks like us, maybe even votes exactly like us, because that Jesus is an easy Jesus to follow. He's already so much like me. I'll follow him. See, we don't want a Jesus that confuses us, confounds us, challenges us, or calls us to do some things that we are uncomfortable with. See, we want that easy Jesus, but the Jesus we discover in the Gospel of Mark is unconventional and in many parts confusing. Even his family knows it, and we're going to discover this in a moment. But every time you read one of the Gospels, my challenge to you is to reframe how you view Jesus because, believe me, you're not just going to understand the story better, but you're going to understand who God is and what God is calling you to do in your own life. So my challenge to you this month is to go with it. Be comfortable with the uncomfortable Jesus. Some years ago, I forced the Oxford United Methodists to go through the book of Leviticus together for a sermon series. And we were in the midst of a pandemic, so I thought, you know what, I can get away with a lot of things in the pandemic, because everything's changed, so we're just going to go through the book of Leviticus together. And I remember trying to provide a helpful image for how to approach the book of Leviticus, or at least, why was this placed in the Bible? Because it's an odd book. And I relied a lot upon what a Hebrew scholar once described the book of Leviticus as, in that when we look at the book of Leviticus, we should treat it almost like it's a a manual with instructions for living next to a nuclear power plant. That the people want to make sure that all these rules are abided by so that they don't do anything to blow things up. They want to respect God's presence and God's holiness and God's power. They don't want to a Chernobyl happening in their midst. And my suggestion for us when we see Jesus in Mark's gospel is maybe to see this is a mobile, walking, powerful nuclear power plant amongst the people. And this, there's this power in Jesus that is just hard to contain. And we'll see in a couple of weeks that even touching the edge of his robe heals a woman. There is power just coming out of this Jesus. And some people are attracted to him and others want to get as far away from him as possible. And even others seek to confine him and control him. See, this image of Jesus will help us to understand not just what made people come to him, but maybe what made people afraid of him. See, right away in our story for this morning, we know that a crowd is forming around Jesus. And Mark can't help himself. He says that this crowd that's forming around Jesus is so big that the people, that Jesus and his disciples, they cannot even eat. These are the kinds of interruptions that really annoy us. When it comes to food, those kinds of interruptions, yeah, That gets on your nerve. Like you're driving to Bob Evans and then a train decides to go through Oxford and you're hangry. (laughs) See, this crowd is keeping them from eating. That's how big this crowd is. And it's not just that this crowd is keeping them from eating, but this crowd is making Jesus' family concerned. People are saying some weird things about him. And when someone comes to him and says, your boy Jesus done lost his mind, Jesus' family says, you know what? We, we got to go out and like get Jesus because he's saying some crazy things and people are concerned about what he's doing. And it's not just his family that's concerned, 
But some of the religious elites are concerned. The scribes come all the way down from Jerusalem. These are the religious elites. They had their skill and their training. Very few people at that time had it. And they come down to put things into perspective, but also to offer their assessment and their maybe seal approval on things. See, this person is not only out of their mind, but according to them, this person is possessed. They have a demon. This is a serious charge. And maybe why viewing Jesus as this mobile nuclear power plant is kind of helpful here. They want to get this thing contained as soon as possible. But Jesus wants to use this as an opportunity to do something. He's healed people. He's cast out demons. He's preached. But now he's going to bring out something new. For the first time, Mark records that Jesus begins to speak in parables. We tend to get amazed at all the healings and the other miracles that Jesus does. But I contend we should be amazed at what Jesus teaches Because these words have the power of heaven behind them. Parables are ways just like healing and exercising demons that demonstrate the power of this new thing that God is up to in the world. And see, the points of contention here are serious. These scribes have said that Jesus is demon-possessed. But then Jesus begins to make the obvious point. How can Satan cast out Satan? It's illogical. It's impractical. A house divided against itself cannot stand, he says. And then Jesus goes on to explain. He says Satan's time has come. It's over. And Jesus talks about the strong man, who in this story would be Satan. He explains that no one can go into a strong man's house without first tying him up. And actually, if we are faithful readers of the Gospel of Mark, this is what Jesus has already done. In fact, we know that the first thing that happens to Jesus after his baptism is that the Spirit throws him out into the wilderness. And for 40 days, Jesus is tempted by Satan. This is the only time in the Gospel of Mark that Satan is given any description of doing anything anything. And it is the last time. We are given the thought that Jesus has already come in and taken over things. And so, yes, how can Satan cast out Satan? That makes no sense. I've already taken care of the threat, Jesus is saying. And to go along with this theme of Jesus coming across as kind of strange, Jesus then says that not only has he tied up the strong man, but he's also gone about the business of plundering. I don't think this morning when you came in here, you thought that this passage that you would hear read for you today would feature Jesus as a plunderer. But here we have Jesus the plunderer. And the same way that we say Conan the barbarian, maybe we should say Jesus the plunderer because he has come in and he is plundering things, things that have been taken away, Christ is bringing back. But then, as if Jesus wasn't being controversial enough, he goes on to give one of his most startling statements. He says that whoever blasphemes the Holy Spirit cannot be forgiven. What? Cannot be forgiven? I thought God always forgives. Is there one thing that you can do that's unforgivable? And here Jesus is only warning them. John Wesley once explained that what this sin consists of is basically calling the work of the Holy Spirit the work of the devil. See, all this devil talk is covering up the work that the Holy Spirit is doing. And perhaps this is why we should probably hit pause the next time we are tempted to call someone demonic or some thing that is happening of the devil. Because we might be describing the work of the Holy Spirit with the work of the devil. 
This is what happens when new things come into being, when new things take shape in our lives. People are concerned. How can this be happening? This must not be of God. This must be of something really bad and really evil. And Jesus is given this stern warning. Don't dismiss it with this devil talk. And so anyways, we can sum up what Jesus is doing here as the work of someone who is doing something way beyond what people expected of him, even his own family. See, we expect the religious authorities to resist Jesus, but his family? This is family. Like, we don't expect them to do this. But let's give them the benefit of the doubt here. They could be concerned for Jesus, knowing that if he keeps this up, things could turn quickly pretty bad. But when Jesus is told that his family is outside, he doesn't go to them. He stays with the crowd. I mean, if he would have left, everybody would have been like, yeah, his family's out there, so that, that makes sense. And I don't think Jesus here is being mean or disrespectful. After all, one of the Ten Commandments is honor your mother and your father. But Jesus is consistently up to something here. If we read these stories in Mark, you should at one point when you're reading them be like, Jesus, what are you doing, man? Why do you have to act so weird? I get this look, and sometimes my kids verbalize this to me. Like, why do you have to be so weird, Dad? But that's the way to regard Jesus here. And he's okay with it. See, these interruptions occur to Jesus and elsewhere. And by occurring, they reveal that none of these things are random or pointless. In in Jesus, something new truly is happening. And this is why I want to tell you this morning that when Jesus shows up, don't be surprised when things get messed up. Just as there is a reason why Jesus describes his work as plundering Satan's house, Jesus is messing up our cozy and comfortable notions of what is truly stable in this world. See, there are certain things that we think are stable and will always be stable. And Jesus is rocking the boat a little bit. I mean, at this point, the disciples, they're, they're new to this cause. They don't know what's going on, and Jesus is already disrupting their notions of things like family. See, we want the things, or we treat things as ultimate or stable, but Jesus comes in to rock the boat, to rock our notions of what truly is stable. He says to the people, whoever does my will is my true family. See, Jesus wants to shake things up. He wants to make our notions of what we think is good and true and beautiful. And he wants to take those notions and disrupt them a bit. He doesn't want us to rely on these things as if these things will give us ultimate meaning. No, Jesus wants to reveal that he is the true center of all these things. Because what Jesus is doing in the midst of all these interruptions is that Jesus truly is interrupting the work of death and sin and the world. Friends, I can't help but think that when Jesus died, Jesus went to mess things up in the realm of death. And that through his resurrection, we find the one thing that is truly stable in this rocky and shaky world. And that is God's love for us. For what does Paul declare in Romans chapter eight, but that nothing on earth, nothing on earth can remove God's love for us, which is in Christ Jesus. That's the only true stable thing. And when that love comes into your life, all the things that you think are stable and offer you meaning get shaken up so that you can rely upon the one thing that truly offers life. So this morning, I wanna end with a challenge to you to embrace the interruptions. Now, some interruptions might just be an annoyance, 
but there also might be something behind them too, something that God is trying to do to you to kind of rock your world of what you think is stable and ultimate. See, the interruptions that occur to Jesus invite us to break free from our hold on a tidy Jesus who meets our needs and our expectations to learn to see that this Jesus is not only out of our control, but fully in control of our lives. The warning here is that if you think you got Jesus all figured out, if you think you know everything there is to know, and it is now your business to use such a Jesus against others, well, Jesus the plunderer would like a word with you. Jesus is about doing this new thing, reforging who we are and how we relate to one another. He says, whoever will do the will of God is my brother, sister, and mother. Again, maybe the interruptions you are experiencing are just annoyances, but maybe it is God doing something new in your life. God's trying to get your attention. And I think we have to get to that point in our lives where we are so open to what God is doing and trust God that we are willing to embrace whatever God is doing. See, the will of God is not a list of rules you abide by. The will of God is something that unmakes you and remakes you. And just when you think you've accomplished it all, God starts over again. See, this is the work of love. We never reach fully that point where God's love is done with us. God's love is constantly shaping us. And yes, as Methodists, we may say that we are the sanctified. And I guess for you Presbyterians, you might say we are the elect. But God is not done for us or with us, regardless of our theological persuasions. God is always working in and through us. So maybe this week, you're going to find that you're leaning a little more into the interruptions that come your way. And maybe what you will find is that interruption is an annoyance, but it's God's work to bring you more fully into God's love for you. Because friends, the world needs people who are open to God's love. And that begins with us. If we're not open to God's love, then why do we expect people around us will be open to God's love? May we truly live so that God will use us and remake us in the way of love so that in all things, this strange Jesus is one we can put our trust into completely. Let us pray. Lord God, it is through your holy grace that you have brought us here today. And it is through your holy word in which you remake us and you reforge us as your family. Lord, despite all our intentions and goodwill, it is your spirit that does the work of unity. It is your spirit that does the work of love. And may we never dismiss the work of the spirit as demonic for fear of what that love might bring us to. But rather, may we accept the work of your spirit in and through us so that whatever we thought was stable and truly ultimate can slowly fade away as we catch sight of your kingdom in our midst. And so, Lord, bless us, we pray. In your son's holy, life-giving name, we pray. Amen. Friends, as Pastor Caleb just said very powerfully at the close of the sermon, God calls us to live so that God can use us. So our next hymn this morning is hymn number 700 in our purple Glory to God hymnals, and it is entitled, appropriately enough, 
I'm going to live so God can use me. Friends, let us now stand and join our hearts together in song. Please be seated. <laughs> Friends, one of the ways that we try to live together in this way as people of faith, of course, is by praying for one another, uh, praying for our churches, our community, our families, our friends, our nation, and our world. Uh, and so at this time, we come together and offer forth the prayers uh, of our lives, both the prayers of our celebrations and also uh, the prayers of our concerns. Um, I would like to start by offering up a prayer of gratitude to each and every one of you for continuing to share your prayer concerns uh, with Pastor Lawrence and myself from week to week with Pastor Caleb over at the Methodist Church uh, so that we can pray for, for one another and be connected in this way. We lift up prayers of celebration this morning for these Union Worship Sundays with our friends at Oxford United Methodist Church uh, over the next four weeks, and we lift up our prayers of gratitude to Pastor Caleb for powerfully bringing us the word this morning. Uh, we also lift up prayers uh, for Pastor Lawrence for traveling mercies during this sabbatical time for him this summer. Uh, we pray for, uh, for him and Amy and Lydia as they will be uh, 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 traveling both locally and also internationally uh, safe travels. We also lift up prayers uh, for important life milestones, uh, for birthdays and celebrations. And uh, little Bertie told me that uh, Bill King had a birthday yesterday. Happy birthday, Bill. <laughs> uh, and speaking of folks who are traveling internationally, just uh, prayers for Candace Christ, Jenny and John Baylor, and Pat Gifford uh, as they are traveling to Iona this week. Uh, we just ask that uh, traveling mercies would be with them uh, during that journey. <laughs> Uh, and for our wonderful parents and adults and volunteers on the Christian education team as they are preparing for our intergenerational vacation Bible school this month. Lord, in your grace, hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. We also lift up prayers of concern this morning for uh, Adele Flower, who is a friend of Sarah Miller's, uh, who passed away this week at the age of 94. Uh, we pray for her and for Sarah, for her family. Uh, we continue to lift up prayers this morning uh, for Mike Murray as he continues treatment for lung cancer. We lift up prayers for Joanne Hagerman, for Dolly Thomas, and for Nancy Wilson. We continue to pray for Sarah Driver as she undergoes treatment for multiple myeloma, for Bill Brown who continues to heal from a bone marrow transplant. Friends, we lift up our continued prayers uh, this Sunday for uh, all of our siblings uh, throughout Gaza, Israel, the West Bank. Ukraine, Russia, and Haiti, for those uh, who seek God's peace and justice amidst these cycles of violence, retaliation, and fear that our world lives in. We lift up prayers this morning for Prue and Steve Dana, for Kate Westpizer, for Jim Baer, for Nancy Sturgeon, for Carol Klum, 
for Larry Hardy, for Karen Simpson, for Jay Fry, for Bill Jenkins, for Wayne and Patrice Houston, for Jan Reinhardt, for Connie Everhart and for Anne, for Vi Suit, for Nancy Gates, for Peggy Stitt, and for Ray Patterson. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And friends, once again, let us pray. <clears throat> o God, in whose mercy we find refuge and strength, we offer our prayers to you. Guide us by your Spirit that our prayers may serve your will. Hear our prayers of adoration and thanksgiving, our prayers for longing of God's peace, our prayers for our community, our nation, and our world, and our prayers for reconciliation here in Oxford and beyond. Hear our prayers, O Lord, both the prayers that we speak out loud in places such as this, and also the prayers that we hold silently in our own hearts that are known to you and you alone. We lift them up in the name of the one who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as we come to our time of offering this morning, I would just direct your attention to these uh, cards that you'll find located in your pews this morning. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, we keep cards like this uh, in our pews here at Oxford Presbyterian Church. And you will notice um, that this, this, this card says the words uh, right across the top, my gifts matter. And these cards represent that there are many variety of different gifts that make the mission and the ministry of our churches possible. Uh, there are, of course, the gifts of our financial giving, uh, but there are also other gifts as well, the gifts of your time, your energy, your volunteering, your prayers, uh, your worship. All of these gifts are vital, and we give thanks uh, we give thanks for your continued generosity, and we give thanks for the many ways that we are all the church and the body of Christ together. So friends, uh, as we come to this time of offering, I would just encourage you, whether you uh, give through an, offer, uh, an envelope in the offering plate or for those of you who may give online on the website or by text message or QR code, we would just also encourage you to place one of these cards in the offering plate this morning as a recognition and a remembrance that your gifts matter. All of these different kinds of gifts are an important part of being the body of Christ and being part of God's mission in the world. And we lift all of these gifts up in the hope and the prayer that they would give glory, honor, and praise to the gift that we have first received in Jesus Christ.
are so blessed. God has blessed our lives with mercy and peace. And so as we dedicate a portion of the gifts that we have been given back to God, let us now join our hearts together in prayer. God of mercy, we give you thanks for all that your bounty creates. The gifts that we bring today acknowledge our debt to you and our intent to relieve others of their burdens. Bless what we offer and bless those who will be shown deeds of power through them. We ask these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 192 in your purple glory to God hymnals. Lord, the light of your love is shining. Let us join our hearts together in song. please join me in our unison closing blessing this morning. May our Creator who seeks and finds us, may Christ who calls and claims us, <clears throat> may the Holy Spirit <clears throat> sustain us until all that is temporary is gathered into God's eternal glory. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Amen. come in all shapes and sizes. And sometimes, yes, they are annoying, but sometimes they invite us to consider the holy power of God's love, to remake us and to reforge us as God's people here on earth. So may you go in the way of love, proclaiming love, and in all things, 
love one another. Go now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Friends, please be seated for the postlude.